Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome to the Morning Devo with Bo Willette. We're going to be in Esther chapter 2 today and wanted to kind of give a shout out to uh, for uh, Memorial Day as well. Um, I was reading Memorial Day started in, I mean it became official in 1971, but really after the Civil War. Um, this uh, kind of last uh, Monday in May has been a memorial day to those that have lost their lives in war. And I, I was putting in the comment corner that I think all of us probably have had someone who's gone to war before. And, um, and it's always been, I don't know if you've ever heard war stories before, but boy, man, they are, have been, they are so interesting. Uh, my grandfather-in-law was in World War II, and he just passed away last year. And boy, we had so many talks over my time with him over the years, uh, and just precious memories of him sharing stories about being in the war and what that was like. And um, I had a grandfather that was in World War II. My dad was in Vietnam. Um, and so, uh, and Hey, my colleague, Peter Martin was, uh, in the Afghanistan, uh, uh, push, um, that the United States was a part of years back. So, uh, yeah, war has definitely, uh, I think been a part of a lot of our hearts and minds. Sometimes we forget that. And, uh, there's war going on today too, all over the world. So, you know, we want to always give a shout out to those that um, 
have been in war, that have faced the effects of war, and really need a lot of healing from the things they've experienced. And hopefully our time in the Word really helps out. So Esther chapter 2. I mean, Israel is kind of, you know, in a sense, you know, been at war for so long. And they have chosen sides really to try to win wars. What I mean by that is they've chosen allegiances with different people, whether it's Egypt or Babylon or these different people. Um, And um, they found themselves losing, you know, and they found themselves instead of trusting God, they trusted in what we call the arm of the flesh. You know, they trusted in their ability and boy, man, they learned a tough lesson. And that is, you know, without the Lord, you know, you can do nothing. (laughs) I love how Jesus says that in the New Testament. He says, man, abide in me. And he says, because apart from me, you can do nothing. And man, that's such a good thing. That's right. Apart from Jesus, you know, I can't do nothing, you know, nothing of eternal significance, that's for sure. And um, so it's a good reminder to us. Um, So Marsha's in the house. Hey, Marsha. Um, So good to hear from you. And I want to hear your guys' stories, too. So it says, let's see, my grandfather survived World War I and my dad survived World War II. Proud of their service. They instilled in me uh, patriotism that I feel today. That's uh, awesome. So you had a grandfather that survived World War I and your dad uh, survived World War II. Wow. So you probably grew up with a lot of stories, too, Marsha, of uh, maybe those war times. Um, and I wonder what it was like to, you know, be in Israel, you know, so many wars, you know, so many battles and what those kids went through growing up. And, and here you have a whole generation of people of, of Jewish people that in the time of Esther are growing up in the empire of the Medes and the Persians. Yeah. That famous me Persian army, that huge million or so man army, that giganto army of the Persians that literally dominated so much uh, just by their vastness. And um, there's movies that are made on the Persian empire. And this is what the Jewish people, all these kids are being raised into, Esther being one of them. Um, And as Ezra and Nehemiah are of the small group of leaders Levitical priests, governors, um, and, and kind of the leadership of Israel, they have gone back to Jerusalem to build that temple and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You have millions of Jews in the Medo Persian Empire that are really in trouble. And so we see uh, in verse 1 a lot of, um, man, massive misogynistic kind of uh, parting going on, right? And Queen Vashti doesn't do uh, a little dance, right? A little, a little you know, jig or something. With, and, and the king, King Xerxes, is parting. He's got a gigantic party going on. What do we read? 180 days, Right? Um, and this is all of his friends are with them. They're all partying and, um, and they're starting to get belligerent and just, just really going down South, you know, and that's what happens when we drink, right? Sometimes we drink and we just go the wrong direction. I don't know if it's ever happened in your life before where you kind of, you know, decided to do something and it led you down another path that wasn't the best. And yeah, that can happen. You know, it's so sim- so easily too. Um, it doesn't take much. You know, one of the interesting things about growing up in SoCal was you kind of had to learn how to drink quick. And, you know, because I was always around um, alcohol and pot growing up, Um, I don't really remember a time in my life growing up where those weren't around, Um, you know, even as a little kid. Um, And so as I grew up, even in elementary school, you get used to drinking and you get used to doing a little bit of weed and stuff like that. And then it becomes more. But what you kind of learn to do is temper it. Um, So by the time you're in, you know, high school, 
you, you can see the vulnerabilities of people getting drunk. And believe me, I had my junior high years where it was, oh, man, didn't do so good. But you learn, hopefully, from those where you go, man, I, I can't do that much or I have to be careful or that kind of thing because, man, you go too far, right? And then, you know, you can really put yourself in a vulnerable situation. And I speak to all those people out in the college land, you know, it's like, you know, you go to college, man, and you never know what you're going to get into, right? And when I was at college, I lived on campus for the first two years. And, you know, I saw so many young females, man, drinking, and I knew they never drank really much before. And, man, I saw them getting a little vulnerable, you know, and that wasn't a good thing. You know, Uh, they can put themselves in some pretty, pretty precarious situations, ones that they would regret for sure, and ones that could be really harmful. And, you know, Vashti didn't want anything to do with that. And so she refused the king's command to go out and dance before all of his cronies. And so she gets exiled. And now the king wants a new woman. Hmm. Interesting, right? But after Xerxes' anger had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree he had made. So his personal attendant suggested, let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women to the royal harem at the fortress of Susa, um, Haggai, um, the king's eunuch in charge. Uh, of the harem will see that they are given beauty treatments. After that, the young women who most please the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king, so he put the plan into effect. So here the king goes, man, you know what? I did have a law, and these laws that we get an insight were kind of set in stone. And so he kind of makes this law, and, and you could tell he's kind of bummed. You know, he kind of misses Vashti. You know, she's a beautiful woman, right? And, you know, it's interesting that the king could have whatever they want, right? And this is interesting. People of power can use their power to get whatever they want. Isn't that interesting? People of power can use their power to get whatever they want. And this is interesting, too, is that we all have individual power. And, and I can force and coerce and manipulate to get what I want. You know, kids do this all the time. They use their voices to get what they want, right? They throw their body around to get what they want. You know, a selfish action. Yeah. But they use the power that they have to get what they want. And that's what we do even as adults. And it seems like the more power we have and the more money we have linked with that power, the more potential we have to hurt more people. And this seems like where Xerxes goes, you know, he's got all the power, he's got all the cash. And now what is he going to do? They're going to do a search of the empire for beautiful women And they're going to appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful women to uh, that are in charge of, you know, the king's kind of harem. Right. And they're going to make sure they're all virgins, by the way, you know, because that was important in that day. And it's interesting, you know, why it's so important, you know, um, you know, and I I don't want to get into all that. But maybe that's for one of my podcasts, you know, to talk about that. But it's interesting how even in our day, there's a a real um, kind of idea in, in, you know, with a lot of men, this idea of, you know, having a virgin. And unfortunately, it's one of harm. I don't think it's one of positivity, but it's one of harm. And the idea is just that idea that we got this like thing in us, man, that just wants to hurt people. Um, and it's kind of sad that that's kind of there and moves throughout our, our lives, um, in so many different vast ways where even sometimes our cultural 
kind of the way we think of things culturally growing up and the, the lingo of the day and stuff like that, you know, um, you know, you know, virginity is this taboo kind of thing. You know, that's why we have so many movies, right? The last American virgin. I remember that movie when I was growing up, boy, that was a man. One of those, whoa, movies, you know, but all these different movies of today that are, uh, about, you know, that have this term virgin in them as well. And, um, people can be embarrassed because they're a virgin, which is super sad. You know, that's a, but that's that's how the pressures of our world are. And, you know, it makes me think too of how much peer pressure has affected my own life. Um, you know, you know how much peer pressure affected your life. And growing up, did peer pressure really affect you? How did it affect you? You know, for me, it was easy just to cave right into it. You know, just to buy into it, just to move with it. Um, it seemed less resistance to me. It seemed like it was a, the easiest path taken, you know, the less ridicule I would get, the less abuse I would take as a kid. If I just was able to go along with all of those kind of stereotype kind of ways of going about things. And, um, you know, but not everybody goes that direction with peer pressure. You know, sometimes peer pressure hits you and you shy up and you go into a cave and you become a a real silent one, you know, and um, you kind of learn to move away from people um, instead of sometimes just having courage to confront the fallacies of all of this peer pressure and its culture. But here, the king, they got a culture. The government has a culture, man. You know, uh, what is it? My, you know, Epstein's Island in our day. What is that? Some island where people go and and uh, that are very wealthy and have secret meetings or something or do stuff. But, you know, it seems like people of power, man, they got some interesting things that go on, you know. And here's, I think, one of them that's, you know, maybe common in the movies, you know, bring in the virgins, you know, get the harem ready. But, man, I mean... I don't know if it, it, it doesn't sound good. I mean, that, that doesn't sound really great, right? It says, after that, the young women, the uh, one that most pleases the king, oh, one that he really likes, you know, that's going to be made the queen. You know, and at the time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, the tribe of Benjamin, Judah, Benjamin, very close tribe, right? Southern Israel. And it says his family had been among those who had been exiled from Jerusalem, right? Um, with King Jehoiachin to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. So see, this is a kid who's been raised up now in the Medo-Persian Empire. Seen a lot of war, seen a lot of tragedy. Hmm. Yeah. And it says, um, this man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin. And, um, and um, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. So cousins getting together, taking care of one another in captivity in the Medo-Persian Empire, formerly the Babylonian Empire, and, you know, taking care of one another. You know, families have to take care of one another. You know, if you go in your ancestry long enough, you're going to find a lot of difficulty and um, uh, things to overcome that your family had to do. And they had to do radical things to overcome it, too, to survive, to keep things going. And that's the real amazing thing about our backgrounds. Nothing's clean. I mean, it's very seldom that you have like a clean line, you know, to something, you know, to some aristocratic world, some elitism, right? Most of us come from, you know, a motley crew of people. I learned so much about my ancestry just a couple weeks ago when I went back to New England and I learned stuff that I never knew before, um, about my great grandparents. One of them actually was a Native American Indian uh, from Maine. And, uh, you know, it just blew my way on one side of my family. 
and and uh, you know these kind of things just you know one of them was german uh you know it, it just unreal never thought i had german in me but i do but a lot of us and and the difficulties and the trials and the reasons why people got together the reasons why they had kids the you know all the things man a lot of difficulty well mordecai is one of these people who's gone through these challenges and um you know um i find it um as i get older i find it very meaningful that people have the courage to walk through what they have walked through and maybe that ha- that that's in your life too that as you've gotten older maybe you've looked back maybe at your ancestry and you have a little more respect where sometimes we can bag when we're young we can bag on the prior culture and the ancient world um but then we start respecting it and going wow they had to overcome a lot memorial days like that right where you know it's easy to to kind of look at the issues of the past and kind of critique them but then when you get down to the nub of it people lost their lives in war and you know you start respecting man the amazing courage that it took um, to do what people did. Um, and so it says, as a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, were brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Hegai's uh, uh, care. Hegai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her and provided her with a beauty treatment. So she was on a, an amazing health plan and um, and she already started her beauty treatments. Hegai saw that she was absolutely beautiful, a very unique woman and in maybe more than just the outward beauty part, uh, but really wanted to to help her. And so he does with providing her all the nutrition that she needs and um, that that outer that outer workout stuff too. And hey, let's train. So they're doing their cardio and getting going and doing all their stuff. He also assigned her seven maids especially chosen from the king's palace and he moved her and her maids to the best pal, uh, place in the harem. So out of the castle where they probably were, the big building that they're in, you know, the harem area, you know, they got their own special quarters. And she has seven people working on her. Amazing. You know, we have just studying beauty in our world, like beauty products in our world is an amazing study. And and you get, you kind of are blown away by there's tragedy that's involved in this industry. And it's amazing how much money is also made on these products. And there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, women want to be made beautiful. And um, and they really have put in a lot of money to do so. And we see that even in the medio persian Empire, you know, there was something to be said about the beauty of a woman. And... You know, it's interesting that the Bible never says that nothing's wrong with the beauty of a woman. It's not like it says, hey, beauty's bad. You know, be careful about beauty. No, it talks about, you know, beauty being something that, you know, you don't want to fix all your life into. You know, things like that, that we will grow old and that their time, we're all going to, you know, time's going to affect us all. That's for sure. But, but there is something about objective beauty in the Bible. And, and Esther had it. She was just a beautiful, beautiful woman. And now she's got seven people, uh, you know, investing in her life. So, hey, let's not get too mad at the women that are going down to the local beauty shop and getting their hair done, right? Once uh, every two months or something or getting their nails done or I don't know, you know, getting that beauty product down at the, the local mall or something like that. You know, in Esther's day, man, if you were pretty, the king would pick you up and you'd you'd potentially have seven maids just focused on you every day. <laughs> Talk about an investment. Oh, man, that's intense. So Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background. She never told anybody she was a Jew because Mordecai had directed her not to do so. Every day, Mordecai would take a walk near her courtyard 
of the harem to find out if Esther and what was happening about her. So Mordecai, the cousin, is just sticking close to Esther. And I love this. You know, it's like sticking close. Do I stick close, you know, to, to my friends? You know, do I stick close to people? You know, do I check in on them? Am I that kind of guy? You know, am I a guy who wants to invest in people? Or do I forget about people and just stay, kind of get them out of my mind because I'm so wrapped up in my own stuff? Mordecai had Esther on his heart. He walked by, you know, and he gave her some instruction, right? Hey, you know, the medial Persian Empire, man, might, 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 you know, there's some, there's some heat with, there's some battles going on between us as Jewish people and them. And it might not go well if they know you're Jewish. So he says, hey, keep it a secret. So before each young woman, uh, before each young woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments, six months with oil of myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. Wow. I just find this so fascinating. Could you imagine the investment? It says, when it was time for her to go to the king's palace, she was given her choice of whatever clothing or jewelry she wanted to take from the harem. That evening, she was taken to the king's private rooms, and the next morning, she was brought to the second harem, where the king's wives lived. There, she would be under the care of uh, um, Shashkat. Gaz, the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines. She would never go to the king unless he had specially enjoyed her and requested her by name. Wow. So you'd, you'd kind of jump from being a, a potential wife, you know, a kind of this beauty, uh, go through this beauty university, and then you would graduate and then have this opportunity to be one of the wives of the king. And boy, man, could you imagine that uh, just, you know, being on parade and then you're one of the wives and then, you, you know, if you please the king, you had a good night with the king, you know, he'd call you back. Hey, let's hang out. You know, really interesting, right? And you, and you kind of, you know, we don't get a lot here, but we get, we kind of understand that there's a lot going on intimately, you know, a lot of risk, a lot of vulnerability, you know, that's happening. And this is what we always have to think of in our world is like, you know, is my sexuality, you know, is it safe? You know, is it safe? Is it safe for children? Is it safe for men? Is it safe for women? You know, is it safe? Or is it risky? Right? Do I start using and abusing? And that's the bummer is like you read these passages and you see that, man, this has been going on for a long time, this kind of, you know, abuse. And there's no doubt these women were objectified and they were looked at as a commodity. And just like with Queen Vashti, they could be disposed and someone could take their place and be used to please the king. Right. That's the point. Right. The object is there to please the king. And thing is, is there's an investment on their soul, man. This is an investment in on everything. Um, and um, it's very, very um, contemplative for us guys, especially of of what our objectifications are. And but not just guys, it's for women and all just all people in general. So Esther was the daughter of Ab- Abihail, who was Mordecai's uncle, and Mordecai had opted his younger uh, had ad- adopted his younger cousin Esther. And when it was Esther's turn to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing except what he suggested, and she was admired by everyone who saw her. It's neat. She didn't take she didn't she didn't seem like a cocky woman at all. She seems very gentle and very observant and very discerning. So very smart as well. I find those qualities very cool with Esther. She's a thinking girl. And Esther was taken to King Xerxes at the royal palace in early winter of the seventh year of his reign. And it says 
Um, and the king loved Esther more than any other wo young woman. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. To celebrate the occasion, he gave a great banquet to, in Esther's honor for all his nobles and officials, declaring publicly a public holiday for the provinces and giving generous gifts to everyone. He really dug Esther. You know, she was awesome. And uh, boy, you know, she seemed to be awesome in just every way to the king. And the king just adored her. So even after the young woman, uh, women had been transferred to the second harem and Mordecai had become a palace official, hmm, that's cool, Mordecai kind of graduates and kind of becomes a palace official, Esther continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. She was still followed Mordecai's directions just as he, she did when she lived in his home. And one day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthana and Teresh, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. When the investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were impaled on a sharpened pole. This all was recorded in the book of history of King Xerxes' reign. So cool. Another book that we don't have, King Xerxes' reign, um, but very cool. It was recorded. Everything written down once again. That's what we get over and over and over and over in the Bible. Everything's written down, written down, written down. Very meticulous. But here you have something very cool. Mordecai and Esther working together to help one another in a place of vulnerability. I think of it this way. You know, you're at a job. Right. Find other people in that job who kind of maybe are believers like you. And then you guys help one another out. Encourage with one another. Be there for one another. You never know who's maybe coming against you. Right. And it's good to have a team, you know, with you. Kind of that crew to be able to encourage each other as it's called today, as the Bible tells us to do, to encourage each other. And so it's neat that now the two is working together. They hear about the plot to kill the king. Mordecai tells Esther. Esther tells the king. And it's found out. And these people are killed. And so you can see how favor with the king is starting to build up, right? <clears throat> Even though it's really hidden who they are, their nationality, how that's going to affect everything, we'll see. Sometimes prejudices run deep, and when people hear about our backgrounds, who we are, things like that, people can really get mad. And so we'll see how this thing plays out. But already we're starting to really fall in love with this Esther, right? I mean, super cool lady. Um, you know, what a neat name. Hadassah, you know, that's her name in Hebrew, I take it. And, you know, she seems super discerning. And she seems very, um, you know, not so just prideful. You know, she seems very um, aware of her surroundings um, and wanting to make right decisions. And so that's pretty cool. I, I love that. And Mordecai seems like a cool guy as well. So you're starting to fall in love with these characters um, in the book. And I hope you are. And we get some good things out of them. Hey, maybe God will you know, give us that kind of quality that Esther has, you know, that when we're in tough situations that we really discern the situation and try to seek the best, you know, um, even though we're maybe in a vulnerable place ourselves, maybe we have to be vulnerable, but maybe our vulnerability will help out the situation, right? We don't have to dig in and, you know, our pride kind of thing. So very, very cool stuff. Hey, you know, uh, what does Laura say? Laura says, uh, unfortunately, women are used for sex slaves even today. Yes, they are. Uh, and it's funny. Sometimes even wives are used as sex slaves in their own marriages. And, and some people don't realize that, but that happens all the time. Where really there's no good relationship between husband and wife. It's simply just one of them's using one of them for sexual purposes. And that's not good, too, even though they might be in a monogamous marriage. And it might even be, quote, a Christian marriage, but, um, you know, really the way they're doing things intimately is not, not good. 
And um, Laura also says, um, <clears throat> wives get cheated on when some men don't appreciate their beauty as they age. It's important that we teach both our young men and women to appreciate their spouses throughout their marriage. Oh, man, that's so true, right? Because we're all going to age, and with age comes um, changes in our intimacy, and we have to be able to talk to one another about that, be open about that. And, um, and a lot of times people aren't very comfortable with talking about intimacy. And that's unfortunate because it is a common part of our life as human beings. So, um, yeah, I look forward to meeting Esther too one day, Marsha. That would be pretty cool, you know. Um, Marsha also says... Um, um, she, she was, uh, she didn't have so much peer pressure, but parental pressure and she never wanted to disappoint her dad. Um, and, um, and man, yeah, that's interesting how that kind of pressure can affect a kid as well. Not just peer pressure, but parental pressure. Hmm. That's good. I like that. Paula says I can relate. Uh, to that upbringing as well with uh, the parting and bad choices. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for God. That's right. I think I think we all agree with that. That's for sure. Um, so, man, what, what great uh, input this Memorial Day. And we will catch you guys tomorrow. Okay? You guys have a good one. And uh, thanks for joining. Mm -hmm.